All right. Welcome everyone to this week Autonomy Talks. This week is a pleasure to have uh, Benoit Lantry from the Autonomous Systems Lab at Stanford University. So Benoit is a PhD in Aeronautics and Astronautics in Autonomous Systems Lab, working with Professor Marco Pavone. Uh, before joining Stanford, he received a Master in Engineering and a Bachelor of Science at MIT, where he worked with Professor uh, Rusty Drake. And uh, his research focuses on uh, the combination of optimization, machine learning, and control theory to address problems of planning and control for agile robotics. In particular, he's interested in pushing the state of the art in both aerial robotics and systems that make and break contact with their environments. And uh, today he's going to talk about differential optimization in nonlinear control, and we are very happy and interested in what he's going to talk about. So go ahead, Benoit. Awesome. Thanks for the great intro. Um, let me just start sharing my screen. Can everyone uh, see that? Yes. Awesome. OK, so great. Uh, thanks for the intro. I did summarize um, everything pretty well. So again, Andre, thanks for having me uh, for, for this week's autonomy talk. Uh, and I'd like to uh, start um, this, sorry, I just moved my windows around. <laughs> um, okay, so I'd like to uh, start this talk uh, by making a somewhat uncontroversial, uh, but maybe underappreciated, I think, uh, taking an underappreciated position, which is that uh, breakthroughs in numerical optimization uh, almost always lead to breakthrough in control and specifically in optimal control. Uh, I'll make that statement a little bit more concrete with a specific example, right? So a lot of you are familiar with uh, some of Spurs optimization uh, and, and maybe some of the, uh, and some of you probably also with some of the work from, for example, uh, Professor Perillo, uh, which, you know, showed uh, in his thesis that, you know, some of Spurs problems could actually be uh, solved as semi-definite programs. Uh, so this kind of simple advance in, you know, purely numerical optimization problems really led uh, to kind of an entire generation of, of uh, optimal control uh, approaches, including some of my own work um, with some of my collaborators computing trajectories and controllers for quad rotors, uh, for, for reach avoid problems for cars, uh, and many more that uh, give us kind of some very satisfying results in, in optimal control. And that really came from kind of that breakthrough in, uh, in numerical optimization initially. Um, and so, with, uh, so with this in mind, um, it's kind of how I want to approach this talk. Uh, and I'd like to draw attention to a class of optimization problem, uh, not sum of squares, a, a different class, uh, which has been known for kind of some time, uh, but it has gotten kind of a renewed amount of attention recently, uh, not because of kind of any particular uh, thesis, uh, but mostly because of kind of a convergence of, of elements. For example, kind of, uh, uh, modern solvers becoming a little bit more mature, uh, definitely auto, auto, automatic differentiation becoming a much more widespread thanks to, uh, to research and machine learning for the most part. Uh, and also kind of, uh, you know, the, the rediscovery of a lot of, of results in sensitivity analysis. Um, so kind of nothing and not one thing in particular, but kind of a convergence of things that have happened that really made uh, this new, this class of problem kind of come back up to the surface. And, and this classic problem is, is problems that are called bi-level optimization problems. Uh, and I will go into more details a little later to find that more clearly. But the question that essentially I'll, I'll cover a little bit in this talk is now that we've kind of had these recent advances in bi-level optimization problems, uh, is there a kind of similar advances in, uh, in optimal control that are, that are directly descendant of that? And more specifically, I'll discuss the work that me and, and my collaborators at BOAT uh, uh, Stanford and also uh, TRI uh, have done in kind of in, in that area. Um, <clears throat> so this obviously also won't be just as a disclaimer, this won't be like a comprehensive necessarily overview of viable optimization, but I hope it will give you kind of a sense still of kind of that growing field uh, and also kind of hopefully give you inspiration as to other places you might be looking into uh, applying these, these kind of uh, novel numerical optimization techniques into kind of your at, at, to make progress on your control problems, essentially. Um, okay, so a little bit of definitions. What, what do I mean by bi-level optimization problem? So pretty simple. Uh, so a bi-level optimization problem is just a class of mathematical problem 
where you essentially have the, uh, one math one optimization problem embedded inside another one. Uh, so either as part of a, its constraint or as part of its objective. So if you have your your typical kind of optimization problem here with your objective and your constraint, uh, if you insert the solution of a second optimization problem uh, in, as either part in as as either a constraint or again as, as the objective, uh, then you the resulting kind of nested optimization problem that you get is can be referred to as a viable optimization problem. Um, a really popular kind of type of problem that you've probably seen before is, you know, min-max problem, for example, or, or a special type of viable optimization problem. Uh, we'll refer to the nested problem, so the, the problem that's like nested inside the other one as the lower problem, and then the resulting uh, overall problem as the upper problem. So I'll, I'll be referring to both the lower and upper problem kind of throughout this talk. <clears throat> um, also, today we're going to limit ourselves to viable optimization problem where the lower problem is considered to be differentiable. Um, and so what I mean by differentiable is something uh, quite precise is essentially that there exists a gradient of the optimal solution with respect to the parameter of uh, the problem. So taking our, our lower problem, what really I mean is kind of uh, what's in that green circle there. So the grade, the partial of the optimal solution with respect to Z, which in this case is just a parameter of that optimization problem, not a decision variable. Uh, and I don't mean, and, and I'm clarifying that early because I, I don't mean, for example, the gradient of the objective function with respect to like a primal variable or some of the gradients that you're maybe more familiar with. Um, so obviously this gradient is like, can be tricky to compute uh, and we'll go into details of how you do that. But I wanna clarify right away that uh, this is what I mean when I'm saying the gradient of the lower problem is the gradient of the optimal solution with respect to parameters of the uh, lower problem. So uh, obviously now we've defined the type of problems uh, that's only kind of part of the story, right? It's not really interesting if we don't have solution methods. So uh, there's a lot of solution methods out there. There's some that are pretty old. For a long time, um, genetic algorithms were kind of one of the you know, very popular ways of, of addressing these types of problems. Um, but just to give you a sense of like the type of consideration that you have to take into account uh, when you're either choosing or kind of designing a solution method, uh, I'm missing just a few here. So something that might affect the type of solution method you can have is whether your lower problem, so the embedded problem can be solved efficiently uh, is, or whether the gradient of the solution of the embedded problem can be retrieve efficiently, whether the, uh, sorry, the lower problem uh, also requires a, you know, an accurate solution or not, or whether kind of an approximate solution is, is, is uh, viable. So all of these are kind of different consideration that uh, need to be taken into account when you're choosing solution methods. Uh, and today, uh, I'm really gonna kind of focus on special types of solution methods for these problems. Um, specifically, I'm gonna look at solution methods that essentially solve the upper problem uh, using uh, by treating the uh, upper problem as just a nonlinear optimization problem and use a gradient based method to, to solve it. So SQP, SGB, so whether constraint or unconstraint doesn't matter. Uh, and then solve the lower problem uh, at each iteration of the upper problem solver. So that's a little convoluted, but uh, I'm sure it'll make sense by the time we, we, we finish the talk. Um, and, and somehow uh, in a way that we can retrieve the gradient of the lower problem. So again, we have these nested optimization problem, right? What I'm saying is we will, the overall problem is gonna be solved by a gradient based method, just a gradient based nonlinear optimization method. And then the uh, lower problem is gonna be solved in uh, kind of any way, as long as we can recover the gradient of the lower problem, like I described before, uh, the gradient of the optimal solution with respect to parameters of the lower problem. So this is kind of the class of solution method that we're really looking at uh, today. Now, uh, kind of limiting ourselves to this class of method, uh, that, that kind of then partitions the, the, the remaining approaches in kind of two main, uh, two main buckets. Uh, and, I'll, and, I'll, and that kind of uh, is, I think, a good way to kind of be introduced to viable optimization. So, uh, essentially, the way that you now you can think of the solution method, assuming that you're using, again, this gradient based method for the upper problem, uh, is essentially now the only distinction becomes uh, essentially becomes the way that you're retrieving the gradient of the lower problem. Um, and so there's kind of two main ways of doing that. So again, the gradient of the lower problem is the gradient of the optimal solution of the lower problem uh, with respect to problem parameters, which can be 
decision variable of the upper problem. So uh, the first way is essentially what people will call rolling out the solver uh, of the lower problem. So what that means is essentially that we will uh, solve the lower problem with a simple solver, and we will take the gradient of, or the we'll take the the gradient of each step of that lower solver, and essentially kind of put them all together at the end of the solution method uh, to to get the uh, the gradient of the result of the solution, uh, either with backpropagation or forward uh, forward uh, forward differentiation. Um, so there's a couple of advantages to doing that. So again, and just kind of breaking down the solver and differentiating each step. So one thing is if your problem is easy to solve and your solution method of the lower problem is, is therefore kind of simple, um, then it can be pretty straightforward to implement, right? So if you're just doing, for example, gradient descent to solve your lower problem, uh, then just kind of accumulating the gradient of each gradient descent step is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, I can also kind of give you some parameters that would otherwise be hard to uh, recover. Uh, so parameters, for example, that really uh, affect the way that the lower solver works. Some of the cons though of uh, this type of approach is that uh, it can be slower to retrieve gradient depending on how complicated that lower solver is. So if your lower solution method uh, takes a lot of step and then you have to accumulate the gradient of each one of these steps and then that can become kind of computationally very, uh, very difficult. Um, and then the other thing that can be difficult is that now uh, we have to make sure that the solver is essentially each step of the solver is differentiable. Um, so that's not necessarily trivial uh, to write a solver that is, is both differentiable, but also uh, accurate if that's like a requirement of your problem. Um, and so, uh, okay. And then the second, uh, so that's kind of the first class of solution methods. Uh, and it'll just there's a second kind of way of approaching these problems, which again, I'm only distinguishing them in the way that we're recovering the gradient of the uh, lower problem. So the other way is to essentially to use sensitivity analysis. Uh, so we'll call them fixed point based methods uh, because they, they usually re they leverage essentially the, the property that the uh, optimal solution of the lower problem is a fixed point. Um, and I'm gonna go into details of that. So hopefully that's gonna be clear. It's, pretty intuitive um, how you actually do that. Uh, but essentially, uh, this gives you a couple of advantages. So first, the gradient of the lower problem. Now, because it's decoupled from the solution method, uh, it can be a little bit kind of more flexible, a little sometimes easier to implement. Uh, it has well understood mathematics because again, this, I'm just talking about sensitivity analysis here, which is well understood, it's been done for years. Um, and it has some disadvantages, for example, uh, that you have to require. So the, you you're require essentially that your lower problem is, for example, solved to optimality. Um, so we'll come back to this table, uh, not necessarily something that like you have to like memorize, but just uh, more or less for now, just kind of recognize that there's a viable optimization problem, there are nested optimization problem. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of distinguishing them, the solution methods in kind of these two different categories where one of them we're gonna write solvers and automatic use, for example, automatic differentiation to take the gradient of each step of the solver. And then the other methods we're gonna use uh, sensitivity analysis on the lower problem. Um, and this is useful because uh, now we're gonna talk a little bit more about our contributions or contribution of, of uh, my colleague and I, uh, my colleagues and I on kind of in these two different categories. Uh, so first we'll start with kind of this first uh, category, which is, uh, uh, this this first kind of solution uh, this first class sorry of solution methods which is to uh, comp to essentially compute gradients by rolling out the solver uh, and so our contribution in that area is essentially to uh, come up with a general purpose solver uh, that is is has kind of the right properties so it's it's effective uh, it, give, it gives us um, a accurate enough solution and it gives us gradient kind of efficiently. And kind of the second aspect of, of our contribution in that aspect is to use that solver on kind of representative problems of, of uh, robust control and system identification. Um, and so we'll, we'll dive into that uh, right now. So uh, <clears throat> kind of more precisely what, uh, what we did in, in kind of this line of work uh, is that we, we implemented a general purpose solver, a general purpose constrained non linear optimization solver uh, that can be again differentiated through for automate, uh, using automatic differentiation to solve the embedded problem, the lower problem of a viable optimization problem. Uh, and essentially most of our 
use of this solver so far has been to combine it with an off-the-shelf nonlinear solver, SNOP uh, in this case, um, in order to compute solution to bi-level optimization problems. So, um, I didn't change my sign. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So a little overview of our approach, essentially of how our solver works, right? Um, sorry. Um, so an overview of how our solver works. Essentially, our solver is is a, is an implementation of something that is very similar to a, a differentiable augmented Lagrangian method. Um, well, so, sorry, it's very similar to an augmented Lagrangian method, and we call it essentially just a differentiable augmented Lagrangian method. Uh, for those who are not familiar with, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with augmented Lagrangian methods. Uh, they've been around for a long time. They're kind of well established. They kind of are not as much in favor these days as opposed to, for example, interior point methods. Uh, but they have some nice properties uh, that, uh, that we, we kind of leverage in, um, in this work. Uh, so kind of overall how our solver works is uh, the first thing that we do is we'll treat an equality constraint uh, as a quality constraint by just essentially using uh, chafe softmax uh, function in stack variables. So essentially you can think of this as we're taking our inequality constraint and kind of using barrier functions on them. Uh, so that's the first thing that our solver does. Uh, the second thing that our solver does is form the augmented Lagrangian uh, of, of the problem that it's trying to solve. Um, and then uh, next after that, uh, what it'll does is it'll use a method of multipliers for a couple of steps. So that's kind of like the first uh, the first couple of uh, iteration of our solvers, it just uses a method of multipliers, which is uh, essentially just treats the uh, augmented Lagrangian as kind of an unconstrained minimization problem, takes a couple of gradient steps. Uh, and then after we've done a couple of these uh, first, uh, sort of, uh, sorry, these, these first few steps on the method of multipliers, we'll, we continue with uh, uh, something that's closer to SQP essentially. Um, and I'll go into details again, it's just kind of the overview, but uh, I mostly want to point out uh, essentially how kind of our specific approach addresses the requirements of a solver for viable optimization. I think that's really kind of the takeaway here uh, is not specifically the, the specific tricks uh, as much as kind of how uh, the requirement of viable optimization and form uh, the way that we've designed that solver. So. First, uh, the requirement, right? Uh, like I listed, we had uh, robustness and speed. Uh, and so those are, are kind of two, two, of the, two of the requirements. So robustness, uh, what we mean by that is that essentially these solvers usually start with an initial guess for the solution, right? Um, so what we want is we want a solver that actually doesn't require a good initial guess and still converge to a good solution, uh, or good solutions overall. Speed essentially uh, is what it means. We just want the solution to actually be solved uh, quickly. So the way we do that uh, is, so we get robustness essentially by starting with this, uh, this method of multipliers, which uh, particularly has some results uh, that show that it's actually more robust to kind of bad initial guess and using alternative methods. Uh, and then the way that we still recover speed is that we don't use this method of multiplier, which has a, a, a first order convergence rate on the, uh, dual solution, but for the entire length of the problem, we actually eventually, once we kind of have one started our, our problem solution, we switch to something that's uh, actually second order in both the primal and dual solution. Uh, and that gives us kind of that faster convergence. The other thing we do is we use uh, modern languages, just uh, the GL uh, programming language, which is uh, just as a very effective use of, sorry, a very effective um, implementation of automatic differentiation. Uh, and so that's, that's how we kind of address those. Uh, differentiability is kind of a lot of little tricks here. It's mostly about kind of smoothing uh, different operations. Uh, kind of to give you a flavor of that was kind of that conversions, like I was saying about uh, converting the inequality constraints to equality constraint uh, using these barrier functions. That's one thing that we do. Um, and I, I'd say like the main thing, which uh, I'm not gonna go into details of every different things that we do, but one of the main things also we don't do a line search, which is definitely like a drawback of, of our solver. And it's why, you know, we our solver is definitely is something that's more useful in the context of viable optimization where um, you really want something that is differentiable and without necessarily giving you like a, something as close as possible to a global optima. Uh, so that's how we do differentiability. And then correctness is mostly 
by having, making sure that everything that we're using is kind of well-established methods from, uh, from years of, of numerical optimization. And we, make sure, we made sure that on uh, some, a few bi-level optimization problems for which there's known closed form solution, our solver was actually matching uh, what, we, uh, what, what the known like, solution is. So that's how we address correctness. Um, okay, so some, some examples. Uh, so this is just a solution method, right? Which is uh, mostly about making the right engineering decision uh, and, and, and kind of coming up with this, this solver that has these, right? That is robust, that is correct, uh, that is differentiable, uh, and that is fast. Um, so now applying it to uh, control problems. Uh, so what we did is just a very simple here, just kind of a kind of toy robust control problem here where we're trying to essentially move a NEN effector from one initial position to the next. Um, now imagine that uh, as you're trying to move this N effector, this kind of this external disturbance, uh, you can think of it as wind that we know is for example, biased to be more horizontal than, than vertical. Uh, and so knowing that uh, you kind of have this, this external disturbance, the goal is to find, for example, uh, a trajectory that goes from an initial position of the end effector to an end to uh, sorry, a final position of the end effector in a way that uh, the disturbance, which is uh, essentially the maximum amount of, of noise that you can get kind of normal to that end effector uh, is either minimized or is below some constrained value. Um, so in the context of, uh, by level optimization, really what we want to define here is an upper problem and a lower problem, right? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's, it's just these two nested optimization problem. So in our, in our case, the upper problem in this case is a trajectory optimization problem, just very like classic trajectory optimization problem uh, where you have your dynamics constraint, you have your start position, your goal position constraint. Uh, and the objective in our case is the minimum or is disturbance. <clears throat> um, so, that's, that's okay, it's just kind of like some robustness metric, right? Uh, robust control, pretty standard. The key aspect though, is that our worst disturbance is computed as itself an optimization problem. So that's really where it gets interesting is that instead of having, for example, a, a closed form solution for worst disturbance, which is how you'd have to do this if you weren't really thinking about this as a bi-level problem, um, or you'd have to have kind of a bounded disturbance and you'd have to be able to say, uh, to have like an analytical way of computing the the, the direction of, of the worst bound. Um, in our case, we can just write the worst disturbance as an optimization problem, which is just uh, essentially optimizing the uh, magnitude of, of, of the noise normal to that surface. Uh, so that's, that's essentially what we're doing. And so it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it doesn't require, really it allows you to just kind of write the problem that, that you have in mind without having to really like think about it too much. And uh, you kind of get the result that you'd expect, right? So if you don't take, the robustness objective into account, uh, you get the trajectory that I showed before, uh, obviously kind of ignoring everything. But if you do, um, you get a, me a meaningful difference on the resulting trajectory. So here on the left, for example, you see the comparison between uh, on the maximum noise uh, on the end effector. If you were to not, uh, not have the, uh, the kind of embedded, the lower problem in the objective uh, versus if you had it uh, versus if you have it. And then um, on the right, you have it as a constraint instead. Uh, and you can show that in both cases, it behave kind of exactly as you'd expect, uh, that it, it keeps either the noise below some constraint value here. We just, we wanted to, uh, on the right, we wanted to keep the noise below, I think it was 25, some kind of arbitrary value between uh, those kind of two seconds in the middle. Uh, and it, it figured out whatever trajectory you need to do for the arms to make that true. And on the left is more kind of optimizing as an objective. Um, very simple problem, but I think it's pretty uh, impressive that essentially you can kind of think of robust control as just kind of this embedded optimization. So you really just think of it, the lower problem as kind of this noise maximization problem. And you really, you write it as an optimization problem, which is extremely flexible, right? And there's a lot of different things you can write that way. Uh, and then you can uh, then just solve the resulting problem with an off-the-shelf solver, SNOPT, right? Um, or any kind of SVP, IP op, Forces Pro, whatever you want to use um, that is region based So I think it's a pretty powerful kind of way of thinking about these problems. And we're kind of, I think, at the beginning of really exploring what we can do with our, our solver. I'm going to skip this example just uh, for time consideration. But we also show that you can do uh, a similar kind of problem, you can solve a similar type of problem for a parameter estimation problem uh, that has to do with contact. And uh, we show that using viable optimization, you can actually kind of scale your, your problem 
uh, with respect to to kind of your data points uh, better. So uh, we can come back to it if, if you guys are interested later. Um, but we're going to go back to this table earlier that we had on um, on our, our fixed point based method, uh, sorry, on our two different solution method. And um, I'll take a quick check with people to see if there's kind of questions about this kind of first solution method. Uh, it's kind of hard to have <laughs> feedback in this in the Zoom format. So I want to make sure if people want to chip in or there was something that really is not clear that I could clarify now before we move on. Awesome. OK, um, we'll open up for question later, obviously. So moving on to kind of the second uh, family of solution methods, um, we uh, will talk about our contribution kind of in that area. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, essentially, again, the distinction is in the first method, we designed a custom solver, right? We designed a custom solver that is differentiable and that has kind of the right properties. And then we solve the lower problem using that custom solver. And we solve the upper problem using an off the shelf, non linear optimization solver. In the second family of, of method, uh, what we're doing instead is we're gonna use sensitivity analysis uh, to get the gradient of the lower problem. Uh, and, um, and I'll go into details of how that actually works. But uh, so essentially our contribution for this is there's no kind of lower problem solver to implement for this. Uh, it's essentially, you can use now two off the shelf solver. Uh, you can use an off the shelf solver for the upper problem, a non-linear optimization solver. And, and then you can, for the lower problem, uh, you can either use a non-linear optimization solver, or if you have a QP, you can use a, a quadratic program solver or anything like that. So you're essentially just combining now two off the shelf solver uh, and, and you're just getting the gradient of one solvers solution with respect to uh, the parameter of the problem using sensitivity analysis. Uh, so our contribution in that, in that area are not necessarily uh, in, the, in terms of solution methods as much as kind of recognizing that certain problems that are, we think, very relevant to robotics or actually have this viable structure uh, that you can exploit. And I'll show that if you do that, uh, there's actually some, some nice gains that you can make on, on some of these important problems. Uh, OK. so. How do we do this? Uh, how do we get this gradient of the of the lower problem, right? Um, it's probably kind of the, the only like real. This is as uh, mathy, I think, as this presentation gets. Uh, and I try to simplify the size as much as possible. Um, so essentially, what we want, right? Uh, and I could describe before is we actually we're looking for uh, the gradient of the solution. So the gradient of x star, the partial of x star with respect to z, uh, which is the problem. Uh, parameter, sorry, the optimization problem parameter uh, on the top left here. The way we're going to do that uh, is we're going to essentially use the first order optimality condition. So the, the KKT condition, which is uh, we wrote as, as G, uh, sorry, G of, of X star lambda star here. Um, essentially, what we know is that uh, for whatever solution that our lower problem solver will find, we know that it will have to respect the KKT condition, um, the, the first order of optimality condition. Uh, and so knowing that this is going to be true for essentially any problem that we give the lower problem solver. So, the, so what that means is that for any Z um, of, of this problem here, the condition here that uh, the KKT condition is going to be equal to zero is going to be respected, right? So now what that means is that you can, uh, you can take, for example, the the derivative of both sides of that equation with respect to the parameter. And, um, and you know that because it's zero everywhere, uh, that equation is zero, like the right-hand side of that equation is zero everywhere, then the, the gradient is also zero. So you get this first uh, line on kind of this lower uh, chain of equations there. Uh, and then essentially it's, it's uh, the line after that, you essentially take your, uh, your chain rule, uh, sorry, yeah, your chain rule, uh, and then you, you get the second line. And then the third line is essentially just doing uh, inversion of, of one of the matrix. So the intuition behind this, and I think it's really the part that is important to, to kind of look at because um, it, it's very like easy to understand this kind of intuitively. This is sensitivity analysis if you've seen it, but if you haven't, I think it, it, it's kind of worth taking time to really pause and understand it. So if you look at this term on the right here, I hope you guys are seeing my mouse. Uh, uh, but on the bottom right, essentially, of these equations, what you can see is that the rightmost term is essentially how much your KKT violation 
is uh, increasing or decreasing when you're changing parameter z, right? So given some solution, as you're changing z, that's how much your, your KKT condition violation changes. Then this other term here, uh, just left of it, is essentially telling you how much the optimal solution of the, both the primal and dual variables is changing when that, with respect to how much the KKT uh, violation is changing. So if you take those two terms together, right, what you end up getting is this uh, last term on the left here, which is the one that we care about, which is how much the optimal solution change when you're changing parameter of the problems. Um, so that's really all, all this is, uh, essentially a chain rule. Uh, and, and you'll see this in a lot of, of different form. Uh, the kind of machine learning community has kind of uh, rediscovered that recently with you know work like OpNet, for example. Um, it's essentially what this is, is obviously subtleties in handling inequality constraint. I just showed you equality constraint here because it's a little simpler to think about, uh, but uh, it's, just, it's still kind of the intuition behind it. Um, okay. So keeping that in mind, going back to robotics. So how do we use that for robotics, right? It's really what we care about for optimal control specifically. Um, there is a class of uh, optimal control problem, specifically trajectory optimization problem that uh, are still very difficult to solve for a community. So trajectory optimization has been extremely successful in kind of a wide range, you know, computing trajectories for humanoids, computing trajectories for quad rotors uh, in a very time efficient way. Uh, but there's still a kind of a, a class of these problems that is just so difficult to make any progress on. Uh, and that is whenever trajectory optimization involves contact. Uh, and so you can think of this as, you know, walk-in robot that has to plan, you know, making contact with the ground or a manipulator has having to plan contact with the object it's manipulating. Uh, so that remains extremely difficult. And these people have done great work. Michael Posa at uh, issue Penn, uh, Jan Karius with Marco Hutter at ETH, um, Zach Manchester, uh, Aaron Johnson, all these people have done a lot of great work, but uh, I think most of them would agree that it still remains very difficult. And one, what I mean by that is these problems, for example, one of the property of these problems is they're often very slow to solve. Uh, they take a long time to come up with trajectories that, uh, that, that involve making and breaking contact with the environment. So why is that? Um, so, okay, you have your typical trajectory optimization problem, right? Um, Think of this as like not even you know abstract contact for a second. You just have your typical uh, control objective. So it's a control effort, for example, is like the the one that you'll see often, or minimum jerk for quad rotor, these sorts of things. You'll have constraints, which will be, for example, your dynamics, um, and then you'll have some initial state, final state. So that's just kind of your classic you know trajectory optimization problem. Now imagine that you have this little system on the right, uh, and what you're trying to do in this case is is to have it hop. So it's a little hopper. There's a ground. Um, and what you're trying to do is have it hop to kind of a set uh, height, right? So you want it to just kind of touch the ground and just do one bounce uh, and, and kind of hit the right uh, target height. So that's your problem. Um, and so just adding this kind of extra uh, element of the fact that you can make and break contact with the ground actually involves adding kind of three sets of constraints, uh, which are usually kind of not that common in trajectory optimization problem. So, uh, well, so the first one actually is the common one is your rigid body dynamics. So that's, um, you know, those manipulated equations. Uh, so that's, that's kind of well established. Uh, the other two sets of constraints are that you'll have constraints on your normal forces. So, uh, and then the last one is going to have constraints on your friction forces. So essentially, uh, most of these different methods that I described before from uh, Michael Posa and Marco Hutter. Um, are essentially introduce the way that they approach this trajectory optimization problem is by introducing extra decision variables. So what they do is they treat now friction forces and normal forces as decision variables of their trajectory optimization problem. So not only are you planning for joint uh, position along your trajectory, but you're also planning for forces, force magnitudes uh, and, and, uh, and direction. So that obviously increases the size of your problem that's one thing. So you have more decision variables that makes it harder, uh, but it's not quite why it's so hard. Uh, the reason that's hard is the specific way that these uh, now that these extra variables are constrained with each other. Uh, the way that they, they, they end up being constrained is with uh, a special type of constraint called complementarity constraints, uh, which you've probably seen. They come up in, for example, KKT conditions. Uh, but essentially, all they mean, all what a complementarity uh, constraint means is that if you have two variables x and y. Uh, their product will have to be equal to zero at, at all times. So what that means is if X is non-zero, then Y has to be zero. If Y is non-zero, uh, 
x is to be zero. Sorry. Uh, if you want to understand this in like an intuitive sense of why these constraints show up in contact, it's pretty simple, right? Uh, it comes up because you have to think about, for example, normal force. Uh, you will only be, we want the robot to only, or its little hopper to only be able to apply a normal force against the ground if the distance between its foot and the ground is zero, right? Um, so the normal force can be non-zero if the distance is zero, and then the uh, and vice versa, right? So if the distance between the foot and the ground is non-zero, then the normal force has to be zero. So this is where they, they come out, and friction is a little less obvious, but it's essentially uh, it's very similar. Uh, and the problem now is that introducing these type of constraint in your nonlinear trajectory optimization is uh, extremely difficult for the solver to handle. So usually, if you're using like SNOPT or IPOPT. Um, these types of constraints are just properties. They're not smooth. There's, uh, there's a lot of kind of different aspects of that that makes it just significantly harder to solve. Uh, now you're resulting trajectory optimization and if you didn't have them. Uh, and that's really what kind of, of motivated us to kind of look at this problem. There's something that's interesting though, is that we'll focus here on just the friction constraints. So we'll forget the normal force constraint, but th there's a similar treatment you can do. Um, but for this specific work, we really just looked at, at friction constraints. Uh, the interesting thing is that the complementarity constraint of that have to do with friction can actually be thought of as the optimality condition of a quadratic program. Um, and the reason that is, is actually, it kind of gets got lost in translation, but it's actually kind of where it came from in the original derivation of people who originally proposed these complementarity based uh, constraint for forces. Uh, and uh, Essentially, the, it, you can rederive these complementary constraints if you go look at the physics of the problem and you, you uh, use the, the principle of maximum dissipation, right? So all like classical uh, mechanics that just, uh, if you just kind of crunch in the numbers, you'll get the, you'll, and you apply the principle of maximum dissipation. So essentially telling you that it, the essentially friction force has to dissipate as much energy as possible in kind of the, uh, some time interval, you'll recover uh, a quadratic program that that's, if you make some linearization, you get a quadratic program that essentially you can think of as friction is solving. So um, when you're pushing something around a table, now what you, the way you can think about it, I mean, it's, it's just a way of thinking about it is that friction is solving an optimization problem where it's trying to uh, maximize how much energy it's dissipating out of the system. So that's kind of an interesting uh, interpretation of that, of that of friction. Uh, and it leads directly to these complementarity constraint if you then take the optimality condition of that quadratic program. Um, so essentially what we did is we went back, right, into these trajectory optimization methods, the exact same one that, you know, Michael Poster worked on and uh, that everyone was working on. And we basically just decided to see if instead of solving complementarity constraint directly, we took the complementarity constraint out and we actually just put the QP back in and treated our trajectory optimization problem as this kind of nested optimization problem instead, where the upper problem, again, is an NLP, and then the nested problem, which is just kind of this little friction, this little uh, quadratic program that's solving for friction is, uh, is kind of nested in, inside. Um, so you get, again, are your set of constraints, so your objective, your uh, rigid body dynamics, normal force, we just kept as complementary constraint, but you can also, you could do the same thing uh, effectively. And then uh, friction force, again, we made it as a QP. Uh, and then, uh, you know, other like, for example, target state. So this is an equivalent problem. Uh, if, you, if you rewrite the optimality condition of this embedded QP, you'll get the same problem that, you know, um, the contact implicit trajectory optimization problem that most people use. Uh, so that's kind of a, a neat thing. And uh, uh, people have definitely, you know, there's been people that have that had noticed kind of this, uh, this kind of QP structure of friction, but people hadn't necessarily tried to combine solvers and actually attempt to solve this problem as just like nested with this like nested uh, solver solution method. Um, and so what we did uh, essentially is to solve the nested problem using OSQP. So an off the shelf QP solver that's uh, is actually based on ADMM if you care, but um, really you can just think of it as like a very, very fast uh, QP solver. It's probably one of the best one we have right now in terms of like solving QP problem quickly. Also has some nice properties in terms of like warm starting that we exploited, but uh, all details that I'm happy to talk about more um, later. And then what we use, and then we, so, so then we have uh, 
OSVP solving our lower problem. And then we use this kind of sent, this fixed point based differentiation that, that I discussed before to get the gradient of our solution after, um, which essentially, again, just requires us to kind of invert a linear, to solve a linear system of equations. Um, so, so, uh, so that was kind of our idea and see, well, okay, you still get a nonlinear optimization problem, but you don't have complementarity constraint when it comes to friction, right? So does that help the solver or not? Uh, that's kind of what we try to figure out uh, and kind of to our surprise to some extent, but obviously we had some intuition that it would help, otherwise we wouldn't have tried. Uh, it did, uh, so that was kind of cool. I mean, it's a, it's a it was solved about, so some of these benchmark problems, our, our computational time dropped by about a half, um, maybe not like a ton, but uh, definitely, you know, those are, we're kind of competing against like an off the shelf, non-linear solver that is, you know, been engineered by people that do that full time. Uh, so. Uh, we're pretty happy that like, oh, you just do this trick uh, and, and you can actually, you know, get some gains. Um, but I think what's this really special about this is uh, not that you get gains as much computational gains, as much as uh, the problem that, that as much as when you realize that the problem that you're solving is actually like the same, you haven't made like approximation of your problems. Uh, and that's really visible when you're kind of solving uh, the both the complementarity based problem and the one with the, the viable optimization problem is you get kind of the same, I mean, within some numerical margin of error, you get kind of the same uh, trajectories. And that's that's really kind of the important point is the viable optimization problem is not really uh, changing the, it's not making approximation to the physics. It's, it's still using the exact same physics that the original problem was. Uh, it's just reformulating the optimization problem and then leveraging two state of the art solvers in kind of a way that like we each use their strength. Uh, and we don't ask too much of the nonlinear solver, for example, to handle complementarity constraint. So I think that's kind of neat. Um, and obviously we tried on more challenging robots uh, and kind of got some neat you know, trajectories that uh, uh, on, on some of the more complicated robots. So that was kind of cool. And, and uh, who knows uh, uh, how much more, you know, we could, we could crank out the, the speed on that by further optimiz doing further optimization. Um, okay, so on our last uh, kind of stop uh, for for this talk, um, well, I'll discuss kind of move away a little bit from trajectory optimization, uh, and I'll discuss some of our more recent work on uh, using viable optimization in verification method uh, for for optimal control uh, for control in general. Uh, the reason I'll close with that is actually because I think it ties in nicely with uh, what I was discussing earlier about sum of squares optimization really kind of enabling us to do the uh, novel kind of a, a really getting really satisfying results in, in optimal control. So if you're familiar with some of squares optimization, uh, you know that the ways that enable control is by actually allowing us to synthesize the open up functions, uh, polynomial open up functions, for example, and barrier functions and these sorts of things. So that's really how it got us kind of the control results that we we have. Um, so there's an interesting question is can, you know, is viable optimization something that can be used in a similar way? Can viable optimization enable um, verification methods as well? So uh, I'm sure you will suspect that the answer is yes. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have this section uh, in this talk, but <laughs> uh, I'll go into it. So if you're just to make sure that everyone's on the same page, I'm just going to review the open up synthesis. Sorry if this is, uh, uh, sorry, open up functions. Sorry if this is a little bit uh, review for, for some of you. But essentially, um, when we have these dynamical system, uh, whether you have dynamics that are kind of learned or from first principles, uh, it's really common for people to want to know whether the uh, dynamics that you have are global, uh, sorry, are uh, globally stable in the sense of Lyapunov. So roughly speaking, what we mean by Lyapunov stability is that was whether every single trajectory of a system converged to a unique equilibrium, right? Um, and more precisely, uh, what we mean is that is whether there exists a Lyapunov function uh, for, for, the, for those dynamics, uh, where a Lupino function is, is, this, is a function for which we have the following three properties, right? Uh, it has to be positive definite, uh, its time derivative has to be negative definite, and has to be radially unbounded. Um, uh, so the precisely, essentially, if you can find a Lupino function, a valid Lupino function that has these properties for dynamics, then you know that that, that system is, is globally stable. Uh, so uh, for example, right, for a pendulum that is damped, uh, if you just look at energy, energy, if you look at energy over time, uh, it'll have all the properties, those three properties. And therefore, energy is actually a valid open function for, the pen, for a damped pendulum. Uh, 
So uh, getting to existence of this function, uh, so finding this function is obviously very useful, but uh, finding kind of, you know, for the pendulum, we could kind of just intuitively think of, of energy as a good candidate. But in general, for general systems, if I just give you a system, it's very difficult to come up with an open up function, uh, unless you have a lot of intuition. Uh, and it's really kind of, again, that's what kind of sauce enabled for, for polynomial dynamics specifically. Um, and here I'll talk specifically about uh, synthesizing an open up function for a class of system called uh, piecewise inner systems. So, um, and, and this class of system is uh, a class of system for which it's especially true that synthesizing open up functions can be particularly challenging. Uh, one reason why piecewise inner systems are actually interesting uh, is because they are extremely useful in doing things like. Uh, like approximating non-linear system, so and, and including hybrid non-linear system. So, for example, a common control strategy in, aeros in aerospace. Uh, think, for example, people designing control system for fighter jets, right? Uh, it will involve essentially partitioning the state space of your system into a bunch of, of different partitions, and then linearizing your non-linear dynamics in each one of those partitions, and then getting a resulting piecewise linear system or piecewise affine system. Uh, and, and then what that allows people to do in general is that then they can kind of individually design controller for each piece uh, and then get kind of like a, a, a controller that is a little bit more principled for a nonlinear system. Um, but coming up with, uh, with open of functions or piecewise open of functions for these systems is, is difficult in general. Um, and there's some classes of methods, but they have some drawbacks. And here, uh, I'll show how viable optimization can essentially help you, uh, can actually uh, be used to design a method that synthesize these open up functions for piecewise linear systems. Um, oh, just to clarify too, uh, this is true for both continuous and discrete time systems. So we have both results in, in that paper. Um, so essentially what we propose is that we will set the, we will model our open up function as uh, by using, uh, sorry, we'll parameterize our open up functions using a neural network. So uh, this is just kind of a, a you know neural network, the same way you've probably seen before, feed forward neural network, doesn't have anything special, doesn't have any like weird convexity properties or anything like that. The only thing that will require is it has either value activation function or a leaky value activation function. Um, and, and this doesn't, really restrict this kind of requirement doesn't really restrict the expressiveness of our uh, of our neural network. Uh, as you know, the uh, value function, if you're, I mean, if you're familiar with machine learning is kind of the most commonly used activation function. So really our requirement are actually pretty loose on, on the neural network. Uh, but our choice of activation function is important because if you look at a neural network, a feed forward neural network, and you only use uh, value activation function or leaky value activation function, which is uh, this activation function on the right, on the, on the slide. Um, what you can now think of is that that neural network uh, can now be interpreted as essentially a piecewise affine function. Uh, this is actually all it is. It's just a very high dimensional piecewise affine function. If you reduce your bias to zero, so usually your, your feed forward layers are usually a, a, a matrix multiplication and the bias, if the bias is zero, you actually get a piecewise linear function. Um, so that's interesting. And it's something, you know, has been uh, observed before that, you know, they can be thought of as, as piecewise linear function. But something that hasn't necessarily been thought about before is the fact that uh, what that means is that now, if you have dynamics that are piecewise linear, uh, and you have a neural network that uh, models that is a candidate low open of function, and that neural network is modeled as a feed forward neural network with value activation function, now what you can do is you can actually uh, check the open of conditions. So the three conditions that I mentioned earlier, you can actually check that as a mixed integer linear program. Um, so that's kind of neat, right? Uh, you can solve this, for example, violation one problem, which essentially is a, a maximization over the input of the neural network. Uh, and, and if you find, uh, and if the optimal solution of, of this problem, for example, is uh, positive, you found like a you found a, a state where the, the open of condition that specific open of condition positivity one, for example, uh, is violated. So, so that's cool, right? You can now verify like if you give me a neural network and you give me a system, uh, I can solve a mixed integer linear program and tell you whether your open of function is valid or not. Is actually proving global stability of your system or not. Um, 
so that so that's neat. Uh, so that's one insight, and and then the second insight is is more related to to again viable acquisition is the fact that um, now that we have a verification problem for a loop of stability that can be written as an optimization problem. Um, it is actually possible now to put that verification problem in the loss function of a learning problem. So in this case, for example, right, we had violation one, violation two, which are uh, our positivity constraint and the uh, negative definiteness of the time derivative of the open function, basically making up a loss function of the neural network, right? Uh, and now what you can do is you can use gradient descent on the parameters of the candidate open up function uh, and and essentially learn a valid open up. So not only can you verify it, but in the context of viable optimization, in the context of embedding the verification problem as part of the loss of, of a learning problem, uh, you can actually learn valid open up functions. So that's kind of neat. Um, and so here's some results on some of the, for example, just two sample uh, system that we use, a continuous time system and a discrete time system. These are a piecewise linear system. Uh, and as you can see, there's, there's uh, in green, uh, there's level sets of the found open of function. It's still somewhat like non-trivial uh, to find. In, uh, and it has a bunch of pieces that necessarily are not like obvious where you would find these partitions, which is one of the kind of difficulty of existing method is usually to find that partition. Uh, our method doesn't have to, you don't have to explicitly think about partition of that uh, piecewise uh, linear loop no function. And on the right, uh, you have essentially those violation that I was discussing before, which are you know our loss function. And uh, you, you can see that they, they never violate anywhere. Uh, and unlike a lot of uh, learning base method for the function. So people have definitely tried to use learning to try to learn the open function in the past. Um, our method, if our loss function is zero, uh, we know for sure that the open up is valid everywhere in state space. It's not a sampling base. It, it's not a probabilistic guarantee. It's it's just absolutely true that anywhere you sample in the state space, it will verified that open up conditions are going to be respected. So a lot of nice properties. Um, and, and again, the verification problem was enabled by kind of thinking about the neural network as a piecewise linear system. And then the, uh, but then the really the learning process, like the ability to synthesize these uh, loop functions came from kind of viable, thinking of it, this problem as, as a viable optimization problem with this kind of nested uh, optimization structure. So on this, I'll just recap real quick our contribution. So again, uh, solution methods can be kind of divided mostly by essentially just how you recover the gradient of the lower problem. Uh, and we've done contributions, uh, my, my collaborators and I, in kind of both of these, these areas. And uh, some of them are earlier results that uh, you know, we're still looking forward to expand. Some of them are like pretty, uh, I think we think pretty interesting results already on their own. Um, and they involve things like piling through contact, uh, loop of synthesis, and uh, some things that I haven't had time to, to discuss, like adversarial learning is also something that we're, we're really looking into these days. Um, and future direction. So obviously, again, going back to SAS, uh, the cool thing about SAS was that not only can you verify, can you find open up functions, but you can then use this kind of synthesis process to also synthesize controllers. Uh, so obviously, this kind of should be a fairly obvious this kind of directions we're going with with this uh, open up synthesis method. Uh, and then the other thing is is uh, there's actually some some great connections between uh, doing domain randomization and uh, and uh, our, our bio optimization frameworks. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank my different collaborators uh, that have been incredible to work with uh, and just open the floor for, for questions. Thank you, Benoit. Very, very cool presentation. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Hey, Benoit, I had a question. Um, yep. So for your first part of the talk, you say you come up with a general purpose solver. I was just curious, like how general is this? And like, like in what problems would this be difficult? Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. So essentially, uh, so our, our solver essentially falls in, in, in just kind of the, um, the class of non linear optimization solver. Uh, so it, it essentially just uh, could technically handle you know, in theory, any type of constraints. Uh, in practice, it's kind of like any non-linear optimization solver. So if you're using like SNOP or IP op, uh, you probably want some amount of some sort of smoothness on your constraint uh, 
to make sure that you can actually use the gradient to go down. Uh, there's obviously you're also doing some sort of uh, quadratic approximation as you're kind of solving this this optimization problem. So then again, having some sort of like local quadratic property is also uh, a good thing. So it's fairly general in the sense of, of as, it, as it really would qualify as a non optimization problem solver. And probably the closest thing to it would be like sequential quadratic, like the, the closest other solution method to it would be sequential quadratic programming. So most things you can solve with sequential quadratic programming, you could solve with our solver. Um, the question of whether we'll find a good solution or not, I would say that is very like problem dependent. Um, yeah, I would, and that, that I would basically leave it at that. Yeah, but definitely not not like mixed integer problems uh, and anything that you know has a lot of local minima. I mean, like any non-linear optimization solver, you'll probably get stuck in them. Um, but it's also that also becomes kind of the interesting thing is that uh, there's questions of uh, how good does it actually have to be uh, in order to kind of solve these viable problems. Um, and apparently it has to be fairly good, which I think ours is, but it doesn't have to be uh, necessarily as good as the upper problem solver, for example. Cool, thank you. Any other questions? Um, I do have a question if I may ask. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Oh, oh yeah, uh, my name is Miguel Picayo. I'm actually not part of IDSC. I joined the talk because Saverio and Bolognani, he recommended me the talk because we are together working on uh, some level optimization problems. Okay. And I was wondering, um, so in your case, you're solving um, the, the whole B-level problem till optimality at every, at every time step, right? Uh, so in the context, uh, so it depends obviously on the, yeah, the, so, the sure, for, the, for the trajectory optimization problem that you have in that case. Uh, do you mean the contact one? The trajectory optimization, the one that you have with the worst case noise, for example. Oh, uh, yeah, to, to local optimality. Uh, okay, yeah, 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 of course, local optimality. So you couldn't yeah. find, I mean, you couldn't find like a global optimal even with uh, off-the-shelf solvers. So a little bit to kind of Karen's point earlier, yeah. My, my question is whether, like, since you have these nested iterations in your solver, uh -huh. Yeah. Um, do you think this uh, you may encounter a problem in the sense of um, that you are able to solve this in real time fast enough so that you can apply it uh, every time step? Can you think this may become an issue if for a large problem or let's say I don't know, a more context, complex problem? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, to, to kind of try to have the like nested structure in real time is, is what you're asking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, so I guess I don't know if that I'll answer your question, so, but I feel free to, to ask again if, if it doesn't. Um, okay. But maybe to like a, a piece of history, I guess of, of that might contextualize that. So we did do this kind of bi-level solver, right? Uh, that uses this kind of auto diff method uh, to get the gradient. And, and we did these worst case uh, kind of robust control problem with them. Uh, and then when we formulated this problem, right? The uh, planning through contact problem uh, that also has this nested structure, uh, I mean, the first try was to to try to use use our solver, right? Uh, it's a QP, but we can just solve it with our solver. Uh, and we did find that we could solve it, but it definitely wasn't like nowhere near faster than just solving it using the complementarity constraint. Uh, it's only when we switched to using really like an off the shelf, like super optimized QP solver, OSQP, that really we saw gains. Um, so it's, it depends on your problem. Uh, I would say to be able to kind of do that online, I, th I think you probably, which like the problem that we showed is really more kind of an offline method. You're trying to find really kind of a feed forward uh, yeah. full, uh, trajectory that, that like is robust to worst case. So it's really a thing that you would do offline. If you're trying to do it online, then I think uh, using off the shelf solver and not auto diffing is probably the way to go to kind of the second like fixed point based method that I think could work. Uh, in practice, I think is is kind of in the ballpark probably for for some of these problems at least. But I mean that's obviously like a uh, like a judgment call <laughs> on my part. Uh, but if anything, yeah, hopefully that, that answers you a little bit. We did try like using the the uh, kind of rolling out the solver for 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 this contact problem and and it just it just wasn't wasn't quite the right like uh, it wasn't it wasn't as good as as we were just solving it as a non-interoptimization problem. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. But yeah, that yeah, answers my, my question more or less. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, obviously, like the doing this trajectory optimization problem online is is a big, uh, is really what we would want, right? That would be like the 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 best uh, outcome is not to have to just do them offline and track them with different controller. Uh, and we have done some work, this adversarial learning work, for example, a value function is, is one, one kind of direction in which we're going where uh, essentially we're trying to reduce the size of these trajectory optimization problem by reducing the horizon and then learning cost to go, which is all very standard. Uh, but it's mostly about how we go about like learning this like cost to go function uh, that, that is where there's some viable optimization involved. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't say that like any of this is, is quite at the like real time level, but Marco Hutter has done some results that, uh, do look like they're pretty real time. Um, okay. For some of the walking stuff. So maybe it's something to look into, but they have, they do, they do a lot of like, um, they, they definitely, um, I don't want to say make assumption, but they exploit a lot of the problem structure in, in, in the way that they solve their nested optimization problem. Okay. Um, but yeah, they have they have done real time stuff. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I can send you some link too if, if you're if you're interested. In yes, please. Actually, I, I I'll actually get back to you um after talk with my contact. Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Last call. Hey. Or wait. Sorry. Uh. Is my oh, yeah, go ahead, Edward. Sorry, just uh, one somewhat technical question. Uh, I guess your planning through contact uh, section, you noted that actually by, by doing this transformation from complementary conditions um, to uh, like, instead of having this explicit constraint written out, you have it as a, an optimization problem uh, within, mm -hmm. um, you know, this works really well for transforming the friction constraint. Um, and in fact, it works better than uh, expert developed uh, you know, op not only your optimization problems. Um, I guess I have two questions is, the first is, could this just be sort of an automatic procedure? Um, like anytime you have a complementary condition, uh, you could just almost mechanically sort of turn it into a, a bi-level optimization problem so that these, these general purpose solvers could just incorporate this without necessarily knowing that it's friction. Um, and the second question is like, okay, if you could do this automatic transformation, do you always want to do it? It looks like you didn't do it. Uh, in the case of your normal force. Um, so I'm curious why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a good question. And uh, in terms of, okay, so in terms of, uh, maybe I'll answer your like second question first, uh, in terms of why we didn't do it for, for normal forces. Uh, there is uh, definitely some, uh, some theory that probably still needs to be developed in terms of like the specifics of the problems that really like benefit from this or not. Uh, I, uh, there's some work that actually has to do, I'm trying to remember exactly the details, but there was some hints that uh, it might have to do with the way that uh, um, kind of the solution space is made so that if you, uh, in the case of friction, if I remember well, is that if you move along the direction of, um, I'm trying to remember exactly what this was. <laughs> this was a discussion with Michael Posa, uh, but essentially that, that the friction constraint were kind of more amenable to that because if you moved in, in the direction of your constraint, you'd still get a solution, uh, but that wasn't still the case for normal forces. But I don't have a super good answer for that, uh, to be honest, in terms of automatic automatically converting a complementarity problem to optimization problem, uh, there's maybe something to be done there. I actually have, haven't really thought about it. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, you'd have to have not just complementarity, I guess you'd have to have really something that looks like a, a KKT system, uh, but assuming that exists, then there's possibilities you could do that. Uh, it's an interesting question. I'm not, I'm actually, I don't know exactly the requirement that that would impose on your problem. Cool, thanks. All right, any final question? None. So I think that uh, Benoit, you left your contact in case people want to reach out and, and have deeper discussions. Uh, I thank you very much for the great talk and, and for, for joining the Autonomy Talks.
And for everybody else, uh, we will meet uh, on, if you join on Wednesday, we'll have the closing talk for the year. Um, so thank you, everybody, and have a good night slash day. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.